All right. So uh, I'd like to introduce the last session for today. So uh, we'd like to have a emerging issues forum uh, as part of our annual meeting. This is an opportunity for the um, folks in the dry community to share knowledge and expertise and experiences. Um, and uh, this is a issue that I know many uh, societies, in particular journals, are struggling with. They're, they've uh, gone that first tier of beginning to think about data policies and data citation policies, and we're beginning to see um, more authors publishing data in repositories um, and uh, thinking of the next stage of how do uh, they support um, the quality control of the data that's in those repositories, how, how to integrate this into review, how to overcome the fears um, that many have and sort of the uncertainties about data review. So we'll have a, um, a little uh, session here with four speakers. I'll just uh, give some introductory remarks, uh, introduce uh, um, Bill Mishner, Eric Kanza, Susanna santa Sohn will um, give their varied perspectives. Um, and then we'll uh, we'll just do a, a general Q and A. I know many folks in the audience probably have um, ideas about this area as well. So, uh, and that will go until four, and then we'll we'll adjourn for the day. So, uh, I guess I'd like to introduce the forum first by channeling uh, John Kratz and Carly Strasser, who've done uh, a couple recent papers that are really nice about data review that set the stage nicely. There's. Uh, um, this is how they conceptualize data publication. It shows how different publication processes contribute different uh, aspects of, of data publication. And in their view, there's a general consensus about what data publication means in terms of uh, the availability of it, the documentation of it, the citability of it, and that there's less consensus around the process of review and the property of uh, validation. So this is a general problem and, and one that um, obviously matters to, to dry edge community. And uh, the reason is when, when we first started and we were supporting the journal, the joint data archiving policy, uh, all the initial journals that we worked with to integrate submission, integrated submission at the time of acceptance of the paper. So after review was over, before it was published. Um, and so that's the green arrow at right on this sort of submission workflow. Over time, we introduced a workflow to allow uh, data to be available during review, and now about half uh, of those are in that blue category. Um, this is almost up to date. There's a few journals missing from this. Uh, but, so about 30 journals that integrate after the manuscript is submitted, but before reviewers see it. And uh, PLOS journals are the, so far almost the only ones, I think, to take advantage of a flow well, that's also the same. The data is available during review, but they submit it at an even earlier stage so that they, they can include the DOI and the data availability statement. Um, but even journals that are asking authors to submit data at this stage, still many of them aren't clear about what happens with it. They don't give clear instructions to reviewers about what to look at. Uh, some of the issues that Tim raised earlier, um, uh, and uh, sometimes it's available for the editors to check, but maybe the reviewers don't see it. So there's kind of a lot of uncertainty about what is supposed to go on during this phase. So it's a little scary to think about this for some because um, it's not as if peer review for traditional articles doesn't have its own share of problems already. So there's widespread difficulty in finding reviewers, getting timely reports, um, to avoid uh, repeated submission Rejection cycles, we're beginning to see companies that provide independent review, like, like Axios that Tim is involved with. Uh, journals are debating the merits of reviewing on technical merit versus fit and significance, on single versus double blind models, on anonymous versus non-anonymous, um, and uh, figuring out how to promote civil post-publication review on, on platforms like PubPeer. Um, and dealing with how to incorporate open peer review on peer print. So there's, there's all sorts of things floating around in the peer review space and adding data to it uh, might seem um, a little intimidating. So uh, we're hoping to provide a little clarity. Uh, what we'll hear about in the panel will be experiences um, that I would say you know, are successful examples of using data review in data-oriented systems, either data journals 
uh, or data repositories that do review. And we'll ask what we can learn from reviewing those data-oriented systems that might apply to uh, systems that aren't predominantly data-oriented, so a traditional journal. So some uh, interesting results from this work that I mentioned with Kratz and Strasser. So they did a survey of about 250 active researchers. It's international, um, largely biologists, but not exclusively, and asked them what they think about data review. Um, so the take-home finding from this um, graphic, to how, the first question, how much confidence in a data set does each attribute inspire? Peer review, is it the basis of a traditional paper? Was it successfully reused? Is it described by a data paper specifically? Um, and the darker the blue, the more confidence. So peer review actually you know, rates very highly for researchers, even above um, the confidence in uh, it being the basis of a paper or being successfully used or described in a data paper. More than anything, uh, peer review is, is valued. But uh, peer review data is not expected of sort of uh, use of the word data publication. So substantially more researchers expect you to publish data set to be accompanied by a traditional publication than by a data paper, and only a minority expected published data to have been peer reviewed. So while it's highly valued, it's not expected, so we have this interesting disconnect. Um, and then surprisingly, uh, despite peer review being kind of valued as a, a quality indicator for data, the peer review of data papers or data uh, of data papers or data sets converse relatively little professional credit by itself. Um, so here, how much weight would you give each item on a research or CV? Traditional paper, very high. A peer reviewed data paper, second. Peer reviewed data set, third. So that flips the order of what they actually value in terms of the quality control for data. So these are somewhat mixed results. They um, are not so easy to interpret. This is obviously a snapshot in time of what attitudes are today as opposed to necessarily, you know, ideally what the world should look like. Uh, but they suggest that promoting peer review of data associated with traditional articles is likely to resonate with researchers as a good thing, even if it's not today an expected thing. Um, and so it might provide, you know, an important kind of quality control stamp um, that uh, has value for authors that do it. Uh, that bad that Brian mentioned might might mean something. Um, so this is a non-comprehensive uh, markup of that workflow for where different kinds of, of review might happen. After manuscript preparation, you can imagine pre-validation of data, perhaps by the repository. Um, and we'll hear a little bit about a model like that. Um, you can imagine during manuscript review that uh, data is reviewed either independently by a repository or as part of the journal's peer review process, uh, sort of combined manuscript and data review. And after manuscript acceptance, um, there's the opportunity to take advantage of post-publication review like data comments, uh, looking at ratings from users, looking at usage and citation. And so let me just give some examples of these that may not be as familiar. There are some fields. Um, particularly with specialized repositories where data pre-validation is, is uh, possible and even the norm. So the International Union for Crystallography can do very elaborate checks on the consistency of crystal structures that are submitted to it, and then the human reviewers get a report that shows where the inconsistencies are and don't have to do the sort of manual effort of looking through and checking the numbers. So um, that's possible if the data are in a very stereotyped and well-standardized form wouldn't necessarily work so easily for Dryad where we get such heterogeneous data sets. Um, oops, that's a duplication, sorry. Um, actually, no, it's not. Um, so for that middle uh, point in the workflow where you either have an independent or combined review of the data with the manuscript, um, one question is, you know, what, what might that mean? And so another result from uh, Kratz and Strasser is uh, from this question, what would you expect data peer review to consider? And perhaps the surprising result, the most um, common answer returned was that the methods are appropriate. 
And so this might simply be a review of the description of the data in the paper as opposed to looking at the data itself. So that's actually pretty easy to, um, to imagine reviewers to, to weigh in on. That there's enough metadata for replication, that the technical details check out, that the data is plausible, that the metadata are standardized, and obviously last, that it's impactful. So there's relatively little here about you know, the authors doing a reanalysis, this kind of heroic reproducibility um, kind of analysis that we hear about um, as being an expected part of what data peer review means. Post-publication, uh, this is an interesting model from uh, Sands in the Netherlands, their easy repository. This is a pilot they did a number of years ago where they emailed users of the data sets they knew who was registered to download them um, and asked them to rate the data sets as a result. And I think this kind of came up in a question after um, an earlier talk as to you know, how do you bring the usage of the data set back to the um, uh, you know, upvoting or downvoting that bad set of seeds, for instance. And then um, finally, uh, another form of post-publication that review has talked about is usage and citation. Um, and so this is an example from uh, Emilio's uh, impact story profile. These are all data sets. I think they're all, yeah, these are all dry data sets in his profile. You can see which ones are highly viewed. Some of them have been cited, um, I believe. Uh, Maybe by me, actually. What's that? Probably by me, actually. Maybe by Emilio. Uh, so there, there is an issue with gaming. Um, <laughs> But nonetheless, so uh, to what extent does this now, or could this possibly contribute to um, the credibility that a data set has in the community and then inform recommendation services or someone who might decide whether or not to use the data set based on uh, whether it's been used successfully and before. So th those are uh, all sorts of different ideas for how the review can happen. And obviously we're gonna focus here on the, the sort of middle tier of um, either pre, publication review, uh, uh, either pre-submission review or uh, during submission and uh, of the manuscript. So um, first off, I think we have uh, Bill Mishner, uh, who will talk about uh, his experience as a founding editor of Ecological Archives, one of the early sort of specialized data journals. Um, we hear from Eric Kanza from Open Context, which is a neat model for um, publication of archaeological data that does review and publication uh, within the system of the repository. And then we'll hear from Susanna Sansone on scientific data, which is a uh, much more recent uh, data journal, if I can call it that, from, uh, from Nature that's very wide in scope. Um, and uh, so I think this, this provides an interesting contrast for, as I say, data oriented systems that do review. And I want to take the panel discussion after the talk to step back and say, can we um, imagine how some of the lessons learned from these projects can be adopted for journals uh, where data is being published along with uh, articles. So with that, I probably went on a little long. Let me turn it over to Bill. Um, we'll save the questions for the panel. Okay. Thanks, Todd. Um, so I'm going to I'm talk about Ecological Archives. I'm the editor of the particular journal. And my um, sort of roadmap to my talk is to explain what the data journal does, its objectives, and so on. I'll uh, introduce the review process and then uh, discuss an analysis that a graduate student of mine and a colleague did a couple years ago, which was actually doing an in-depth look at the peer review process of the data papers. So we analyzed all the peer reviews that we had and then identified the, uh, the types of errors that were encountered. And I'll explain how all that worked in just a minute. And then I'll conclude with some lessons learned and then uh, some uh, future looking at how we can improve the uh, data peer review process down the road. So Ecological Archives is uh, part of the family of journals by the Ecological Society of America. Um, the whole goal is there is to publish really premier data sets 
that are impactful in the field of ecology. Many of these data papers have served as the foundation for numerous publications, both in ecology, ecological monographs, as well as other journals outside of the family of ecology, uh, Ecological Society of America. So they are, the papers are submitted as uh, two parts. They're the data sets, which can be numerous, uh, and then also the metadata, which is, follows a specific format that is really quite detailed uh, and comprehensive. Uh, the whole goal there is to um, allow people to easily interpret, understand, and uh, potentially use and uh, use the data. Uh, we don't necessarily ask the reviewers to think about reproducing results because, again, a lot of these data uh, products have served as a basis for numerous publications, and it would be, uh, you know, many months' effort to try and reproduce all of that. So. Uh, we don't ask for that, but we do look for a good review of the data. So we're located at ESA.org. Um, I just wanted to show you this. This is, uh, you can do a quick search of Ecological Archives. Um, the little button's up here. You can search um, for data papers by clicking yes, and then you can, uh, if you just click a year, you'll get all the data papers up for that year, or you can specify and look for uh, particular authors. If you know an author published a paper within a year, I highlighted one here that was um, really pretty interesting. This was a data paper, or actually a series of data papers by uh, David and Deborah Clark uh, that were collected at the Organization of Tropical Studies field station in Costa Rica. And the first data paper was in 2000. And these are extensive forest plots that have incredible biodiversity data associated with them, as well as lots of other uh, physical, chemical data. Uh, and then they republished again in 2006, and then republished again in 2012 before they uh, retired off to uh, Colorado. Um, this set of data papers has received an incredible amount of use, uh, both not only for facilitate new science, but also as part of uh, classroom exercises and so on. So the data paper looks more or less like this. It's, um, um, it starts off with, uh, again, a title, and then you can click and identify the authors, data files, abstract, and metadata. Uh, the metadata, again, follows uh, guidelines that were published in 1997 that serve as the foundation for ecological metadata language, which is probably the most comprehensive specification for metadata uh, out there. And the one thing that's really nice about the data publication uh, that helps increase the exposure is the fact that when the data paper is published, the abstract is also co-published at the same time in the journal Ecology. So this is, uh, again, their abstract for the uh, 2010 data set showing up in ecology, and then you can click very easily and go to the actual data paper in ecological archives and so on. Um, so that was a little bit about it. We've uh, now uh, published about uh, a little over 100 uh, data papers in the journal, and we've been at it for close to a, a decade now. The peer review process, uh, explain that real quick. Uh, first of all, we look for four major criteria. Um, is it an important data set? Is it of interest to Ecological Archives users, which again includes ecologists, environmental scientists, and others? Um, how technically sound is the uh, database? Uh, is it original? And then fourth, uh, the degree to which the metadata fully describe the data set. Uh, and as you might expect, it takes some um, specific additional instructions because we don't have a strong culture in the sciences of peer review. So we provide some uh, very specific guidelines to aid the reviewers in their review of data papers. Uh, again, most reviewers have reviewed lots of publications, but when it comes to reviewing a data publication, data paper, it's a, it's a different beast altogether. So these are some of the additional criteria that we um, educate the reviewers about, uh, and I'll just read through these. There are some examples here. These are not uh, inclusive at all. There are lots of other little 
pieces and parts that we ask people to look at, but this will give you some sense in terms of what we're looking for. One is metadata presentation. Is it logical, organized, accurate, and so on? Is it com Are the metadata complete? Are they sufficient to enable someone to really understand and possibly use and use the data? Uh, how well are the data organized? Uh, what are, what's the quality of the data? Are there sufficient QAQC mechanisms uh, employed and described in the metadata? Um, data integrity, so what happens when you transfer the data file? Do you have the information there that's sufficient to determine whether or not the data were transmitted without error? So check some techniques and file size and so on. Uh, methods, so this gets to the design of the study and the methods employed, were they sound and sufficient? Uh, the study design, is it uh, an appropriate statistical design and so on? Uh, errors uh, associated with all aspects of the data and metadata. And then citations are uh, the data uh, sources and study sites and all the other information adequately cited. So it takes some, so again, as the editor, and I'll spend an extra minute or two on this because I, I didn't include a slide on it, but nevertheless, I think it's important to, to think through what the qualifications are for peer reviewers and how that works. So one, we have, fortunately, in even though we ecological archives is a relatively small, and the data papers part of it is a relatively small quote journal, uh, having published just a little over 100 papers or so in a, close to a decade, um, we still have to draw upon an incredible diversity of uh, reviewers out there. So fortunately, we have access to all of the reviewers for ecology, ecological monographs, ecological applications, ecosphere, and others. And that really helps us, uh, helps me, as I'm assigning reviewers to review these data papers. And what I'm looking for, first and foremost, is someone that has expertise and keen interest in the subject matter. So uh, that's one of the search criteria I will use to identify reviewers. Um, we also, um, and I don't know how, I'm also an editor for another journal and a different family of journals. I don't know how common this is across uh, different publishers and so on, but we rank our reviewers as well in ecology. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say this, but we, we actually <laughs> do. So we, the editors get a chance to rank the reviews, reviewers in terms of the quality of the review that they have provided. So I'm always looking for reviewers that are number one or possibly number two, you know, and we go from one through five, I think is the bottom. And one and two are, are usually exceptionally good reviewers, and then you get down to five, and they're not doing such a uh, great job. I also look at turnaround time, so we track how quickly reviewers turn around their reviews. And then uh, oftentimes if I will look and see and attempt to discern what type of technical expertise the reviewers have as well. For example, if I see that they've published data papers or methods papers or something on their own, and that elevates them in my mind. Uh, I look for clearly for that they're free of conflict of interest. And then we have another category that uh, includes notes about the reviewers. So if they stated that, you know, hey, I'm getting ready to go on sabbatical, I'm really busy, I don't have a whole lot of time for this, or, you know, I'm in the hospital or I've got family issues or whatever, you know, take that into account as well. So we have reviewers that actually have adequate time to contribute to it. And again, I'm looking for expertise to make sure that someone had, if um, you know, can potentially pull down a data set, open it up, uh, do some playing around with it in R or another uh, uh, analytical packages and so on. So that's the process. And then, um, in 2013, um, in the Journal of E-Science Librarianship, uh, Corinna Kirvin, uh, she's a graduate student associated with the Data One internship program in the summer, and then Bob Cook, who runs or is associated with the uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory Distributed Active Archives Center for Biogeochemical Dynamics. He's a colleague of mine. He's also been involved in peer review of data products for a uh, couple decades now. So we looked at all of the reviews from 2004 through about the first quarter or so of 2012, 
and then analyzed um, all of the reviewer comments and bend them into different categories that corresponded to the data lifecycle. Uh, in this case, um, errors that associated with describing how the data were collected or organized in, let's say, tables. Uh, the description part of it, are the metadata complete, incomplete, you know, are there errors associated with that? QAQC is the assurance part of the life cycle. Preserve, preservation aspects, uh, discovery, integration, and analysis and visualization. And not, um, the, the last bar in 2012 is a relatively small number of data papers, so there's, there's no real trend from one year to the next. There's a lot of bouncing around in terms. So, but this shows the um, average number of errors that we encounter per year and then breaks it out by those different data lifecycle stages. And it's easy to look at it uh, in breaking it out into pieces and parts. The most common errors were in describing how the data were collected and how they were organized. Uh, and by organized, I mean that could be uh, you know, a missing label on a column or um, an, an error associated with that or um, inadequate description of how the data were collected. And then uh, description gets into uh, a whole array of metadata components. So that's the entire metadata record associated with the data publication. And this is where we commonly see, again, a lot of, a lot of errors. Fewer with respect to assurance and discovery, and then even fewer with respect to preservation, integration, and analysis. The um, average number of errors per data paper was uh, roughly eight uh, for collection and organization, uh, roughly nine for the metadata, and then fewer, one or less, for uh, all of the other different data lifecycle categories. But in total, this averages out to about 17, 18 errors on average that are identified per data paper submission. So, and this is sort of summarized the results of that study, and it goes into a lot of detail and provides a lot more specific granularity about the types of errors that we encounter and so on. Um, <clears throat> but this sort of summarizes that most of the errors were with respect to the metadata being inadequate to enable others to interpret and potentially reuse the data, and then also the data organization side of it. <clears throat> so there were three lessons that I think we learned from looking at ecological archives and the peer review process. And again, when the objectives are to support interpretation and enable secondary usage, uh, one, data peer review requires significant technical and domain expertise. It really requires both of them. Uh, and I heard that from time and time again from the reviewers in terms of, you know, a couple of them said this really pushed me outside my, you know, my comfort zone. Uh, I got a graduate student or a postdoc to come and help me, you know, with certain aspects of it and so on, which is, again, very beneficial um, approach. Uh, data peer review, it, it takes time and costs money. I would, I, I think all of the reviewers for Ecological Archives would agree that it takes a lot more time to effectively review a data paper than it does to review a journal paper for ecology or ecological monographs. Uh, it's just, an, I mean, you have to uh, think through the science behind the data set as well as really get into the technical analysis and assessment of the, both the data and the metadata. And, um, and then third, I think, you know, given that we discovered an average of close to 20 errors per paper, um, and the reviewers did a remarkable job in terms of responding to those peer review comments and greatly improved the quality of the product, uh, I think that's a, a worthwhile uh, um, uh, reinforcement for having data peer review of uh, data papers. So I wanted to, just based on my experience with this process, think through how we might improve the um, peer review process for data. And there are several things here, and a lot of these are maybe at, at a fairly high level, but I'm going to come back and touch upon three or four of them with a little bit more detail in just a minute here. 
Uh, first of all, I think it's clear probably to everyone in this room that we really need to improve the uh, data management literacy of scientists and students. And we really need to incorporate this into uh, introductory biology classes, all introductory sciences, I think, in order to, to see a real change uh, as we move forward. In, a, in, a, in addition, I think there's a related thing that we can do, probably more at the graduate level, and this is to provide experiential training in peer review of both data and papers. Uh, I think we make this shameless assumption that you know, if someone's going through a career uh, in science, that they're automatically going to become good peer reviewers, and that's just not the case at all. So I think, and I, I'm aware of a number of graduate courses and junior faculty training efforts where um, there are efforts to train in this area, and I think it really is quite beneficial to do that. Third, and one thing that we did, I think did successfully in ecological archives, we, was, we established clear guidelines for both the data providers and the reviewers, uh, what we were looking for. And we set the bar really quite high with respect to the level of metadata that we expected. So we encouraged uh, comprehensive filling in of ecological metadata, again, which is a very comprehensive uh, metadata specification. Um, I think we better need to better acknowledge peer reviewers, um, again, to encourage people to do that. It, it's very time consuming, and I think you know, we need to give people credit for that. Um, I think this follows with some of Brian's comments previously, as well as others that we've heard over the course of the day. We need to elevate the visibility of peer reviewed data through both citations, altmetrics, awards for most cited, like the, the uh, paper and dryad that's been downloaded 5,000 sometimes, that's really remarkable to see that much usage. Um, one thing that I will continue to hound the funding agencies about is um, if we really want to change the culture, we need to provide some better tools for doing that. And we need to make it easier for people, let's say, to create uh, metadata than, than it is right now. And then lastly, I think there are some things we can do to automate the process, and I'll touch upon these in the next couple of slides, but to uh, really work on provenance and some semantics uh, solutions. So what do I mean by that? First of all, this is uh, a provenance tool that we're working on in Data One, and one of the things that we're, uh, this is an example from the um, Arctic uh, Ocean Observatory System, and if you look on the left, you see those circles, and this is a, this is a mock-up for our usability testing right now, so uh, some of the words may not make a whole lot of sense. But anyway, you look on the left, and you'll see six papers or six data products that are feeding into this one in the center here that we've highlighted, which is metadata, the historical CTD data from the Gulf of Alaska. And then if you look over to the right, that data set is then being used, has been used in two subsequent uh, data products or, or publications. So this is one way of, at a fairly high level, of looking at the provenance associated with data, data products, where they may have been derived from, if they integrated data from, let's say, climate sources or other sources, uh, and then also how they were used subsequently. Were they used in subsequent papers uh, and merged with other data and so on? And this is just one component of provenance, but nevertheless, I think it's, it's an important one. Uh, the second one that I think is really clear, and that is when people submit data products, I don't think you can ever be assured that they're 100% correct. Uh, we, we uncover problems with data by using them, you know, and there may not be any um, anything intentional, but it may be an oversight or something that was left out in the metadata or whatever that could really facilitate usage and interpretation by others. So this uh, solution here, again, is one that we're working on um, in Data One um, via lots of encouragement from the community here, and this is to be able to add semantic, uh, semantic annotation, add notes to data products that exist. So in this case, uh, we've got 
you know, question about one of the variables here, and then the author is responding with a comment, and someone's saying, you know, you can improve it maybe by adding this, or so on and so forth. But it's a way to continue to have data products and essentially be living um, products that can be used by others down the road. And uh, Dryad, of course, has done <clears throat> doing a great job in terms of allowing people to update their data products over time and, and show those linkages as well. <clears throat> One thing I think we could all um, agree on is we need to work culturally to promote open science. And I just want to highlight a couple of things off of this. This is from the Open Knowledge and Open Definition Advisory Council on October 2014. And if you've not seen this, I just really like this definition of open work, which uh, again is geared towards promoting and supporting open science. But I've underlined a couple of things here. You know, open work, ideally, uh, these are working definitions, should ideally have uh, an open license. This includes freedom to use, build on, and modify and share data product. Um, access, uh, the product should preferably be downloadable via the internet without charge. And then one that I think is uh, stepping a little bit further, but I think it's very useful as well, is open format. The data should be machine readable, available in bulk, and provided in an open format, or at the very least can be processed with at least one free Libra open source software tool, which uh, again, I think is moving us culturally in, in the right direction. I should also introduce the picture here, but um, I've got, this is a conceptualization of mine, it's in uh, um, publication right now. But it's, uh, it goes through the scientific process as well as the data life cycle. And it shows the process of generating ideas, number one up the top in gold, uh, planning, research, and writing proposals this is the green. Uh, the reddish is undertaking the research. This is the data life cycle. And then lastly, disseminating uh, results. And this shows um, some tools that are open source, um, tools that can lead to the creation of a, let's say, a proposal or can support different aspects of the data life cycle. And then also how you can publish, let's say, the results of some of these different elements like publishing your code associated with quality assurance, quality control. So there's both input tools and output tools. And then lastly, um, or near the last, is uh, altmetrics. And again, I think uh, promoting um, continue to expand the altmetrics approach, showing things like maybe community service, which would be reviews of data papers, uh, proposal reviews, et cetera. And then, um, again, we heard this previously from Todd, so I won't belabor this. Uh, for more information, I would encourage you to check out ESA.org as well as data1.org. And uh, with that, I think it's up to the next speaker here. Thanks, Bill. All right. You might have to introduce yourself as you wish. Full screen. Full screen. Full screen. Full screen. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, coming in from a somewhat different perspective, I'm coming in um, from archaeology, and I'll talk a little bit about some of our experience in trying to publish archaeological data, and um, coming also from the context of working in a small nonprofit organization that's working in this field um, that articulates with uh, uh, a larger ecosystem of uh, other institutional actor, actors like museums, um, scholarly professional societies, digital repositories, um, and other publishers. And it's in, in it's in that kind of context that I want to frame some of, some of this discussion. So um, we're all sort of familiar with the normal picture of what scholarly communications is like and how it's been transformed or not um, in the ways in which uh, professionals sort of see themselves and, and, and their dissemination practices and how that gets evaluated by their colleagues. 
I'm not going to belabor that point, but this is actually something that is um, also a big issue in archaeology. Um, even in uh, some of our uh, related fields in the humanities, say the um, American Historical Society, um, the Modern Language Association, already some of these other professional societies are starting to recognize new forms of scholarly communication, digital publication, uh, new media kinds of uh, uh, contributions as something that should be the focus of um, uh, uh, professional recognition. This hasn't really happened quite yet in archaeology, and one of the aspects of what uh, we're trying to do with Open Context is work with professional societies and try to make sure that this stuff actually does get professional recognition for things like uh, promotion and tenure and all that. Um, our uh, issue in archaeology is especially acute um, because of the perverse incentives in normal publication uh, is a problem in archaeology because uh, when you, our research methods are typically destructive. So when you excavate an archaeological site, you're destroying that site. So the primary evidence, the documentation that you create in the process of excavation, that is the only record that's going to be available for anybody generations down into the future. That record is now largely digital, and so we have a tremendous um, preservation imperative. However, uh, we're dealing with the reality of professional incentives in extreme competition now uh, in the job market and for funding that makes this sort of a situation where you hold on to your data for dear life and you fall into a volcano. Um, that is something that is uh, one of the big issues we have to address. Now, uh, back around the profession, um, how many of you know who this is? A friend Frederick Taylor. Anybody know Frederick Taylor? The founder of the Harvard Business School, we get the word Taylorism out of Frederick Taylor. The idea of measuring metrics, job performance as something that can be quantified uh, is something that is now uh, pervasive in the academy and including in archaeology. This is an issue where, uh, you know, the, the sort of proverbial publisher perish, um, the issue that was raised earlier in Brian's talk about uh, quant uh, quantity over quality because we can measure things that means that uh, we tend to focus that as how we evaluate um, people's contributions. This is a big problem. And a lot of the rhetoric that we see around data sharing, data publishing, and all that sort of, sort of centers, again, in sort of Taylor's kinds of perspectives, right? So um, if we're problem facing the problem of bad metrics, like things like impact factors and publishing uh, numbers of journal, journal papers that you publish, maybe we could fix it with better metrics, like alt metrics, to uh, see uh, new forms of contributions measured in that kind of a way. I think that those are invaluable and important kinds of conversations. However, we also have to uh, maybe examine a little bit of the um, underlying assumptions around all of that. Um, is, is, is impact especially short-term measurable impact, um, something that is the only thing that we should be value, valuing about certain kinds of data sets. Because again, coming from archaeology, we're destroying the sites that we're excavating. We still have a preservation imperative around this, even if there's not going to be much very short-term research impact around some of the materials. So that's something that we need to consider. Uh, sustainability. Um, big hard question, can of worms, uh, especially uh, considering funding issues. Uh, uh, supposedly Congress just slashed the NSF uh, 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 social science budget by something like 45%. So um, uh, that's going to be uh, interesting. Anyway, um, now uh, this is uh, just a screen grab of open context just to introduce a little bit about what we're doing, working in this general sort of a neat uh, uh, space. Um, as I mentioned, uh, ar archaeology has a lots of different institutional actors that are involved in it. Um, that and, it, and it's interesting because it's also spanning the humanities, the social sciences, and the natural sciences. We have to synthesize the results of lots of different, very different kinds of diverse kinds of domains. And uh, um, this is where things like linked data becomes really important. And that's going to be a theme for the rest of the talk. Um, with, uh, with Open Context, we're publishing lots of linked data, and we try to align our publishing processes uh, toward that end, um, and we make these available with open APIs. Um, we actually uh, accession the data that we uh, uh, curate also on GitHub, uh, which also facilitates things like mass download. Um, for the long term, we archive data with the California Digital Library with a merit repository, 
And that is our sort of long-term institutional hub because uh, who knows, someday maybe, maybe GitHub will go evil and we, can't, we won't be able to use them again. And uh, we're also now working with the uh, German Archaeological Institute, um, which is giving us a um, mirror hosting. And this is actually a screen grab of new version of Open Context, which is um, on their on, uh, hosted by them uh, that is uh, now in development. And um, uh, it's on our blog. You can find a link to it and poke around. Uh, one of the other interesting things about archaeology is what we mean about data isn't necessarily what you mean about data and of its kinds of disciplines. So we do have a lot of structured data in the sense that uh, information that is the kind of stuff that you would see ta uh, in tabular format and spreadsheets and databases and whatnot. Um, but we also have a lot of less structured kinds of information, a lot of imagery, um, a lot of field notes and a lot of other sorts of media, so videos, all sorts of uh, interesting kinds of documentation that we have to interdigitate with the rest of the documentation um, in order to make a, a sensible larger picture. And um, one of the issues that I want to raise with this is that um, these are also important for reproducible research, referencing specific items of images, specific uh, other forms of things like field notes is also really important. That's where things like web URIs are going to be very important for um, uh, reproducibility. So these are just a, a few examples of primary archaeological de documentation. This is from a site in Turkey called Kenantepe, um, spans from the late Neolithic and through the Iron Age. And um, you'll see that there are photos of essentially dirt and uh, with, uh, with some um, uh, that, that archaeologists are taking to record stratigraphy, recording archaeological features and whatnot. And this, this photo is an important kind of documentation, although it's not used necessarily much um, in, in, uh, for quantitative kinds of studies. This is an uh, example of field notes associated with it. So uh, this is an excavation diary recording the progress of some excavation. And it's linked up with all sorts of other uh, kinds of documentation. Uh, you'll notice that there's a couple dots there, the orange dots, in the editorial status that this specific data set has gone through. Um, when we're publishing data, we also have an editorial process we're not um, a sort of a binary accept or reject, but what we do is we provide additional dots, essentially. It's sort of like a badge for the amount of um, uh, review that a given data set has gone through. And um, as uh, the data set sees more scrutiny and as the data creator helps responds to that scrutiny, then we add more dots to that to indicate that it, that it has been, that it has seen uh, a more uh, intensive evaluation. Um, just to illustrate, here's a little bit of an example of reuse, and this is just reuse of some of those things like field notes and pictures and things. This is by Federico Bucciolati, just collecting some uh, uh, doc primary documentation, and he's interested in uh, energetics and logistics and labor investment involved in monumental architecture. In order to get that kind of information, he needed to go through, read a lot of the field notes, look at the pictures, measure rocks, do that kind of thing, and build up structured data in that sort of way. So he's building data on top of the primary data in the terms of field notes that we're, that we're curating. Um, we're um, also not really a conventional repository in, in other senses of the word. And just to give a little bit of an illustration about that, um, open context has very different levels of granularity about what we expose and what we make searchable and what we make citable than um, more conventional sorts of repositories. So most repositories are making digital files the main subject of metadata documentation and the main object of citation. We're uh, working in a little bit differently, um, and we're exposing archaeologically meaningful entities, archaeological observations, as the main thing that you're citing and the main thing that you're discovering through a search interface. So it's a high degree of granularity in, in being able to retrieve things. We're also mapping data into a common schema and making it available um, in common formats through a common API. This is something that's intended to try to simplify use of a lot of very complicated kinds of data, and I'll explain what I mean in a, in a little bit. 
and were a lot more expensive and a lot harder to scale because of all of this work that goes into producing data. So uh, we've been called a boutique publisher, which is cool. So on managing some of the complexity and what goes into all of that, uh, and this is part of our publishing and editorial process, is that we would get from contributing researchers uh, gobs and gobs and gobs of files. So one archaeological project, like the Kenantepe project, might have 20 different files. Some of them are going to be complicated relational databases that could have something like 50 different tables related with one another, plus a smattering of spreadsheets. Some of those spreadsheets are going to be recording associations between objects and photos. Some of them are going to be recording where these things end up in a conservation, object conservation. So there's a lot of different kinds of data sets that are coming in from several different specialists. There are people who study animal bones at archaeological sites. There are people who study soil. There are people who study pottery, different other kinds of material cultures. You have a lot of different specialists working in one project each managing their own data and bringing all of these things together in a meaningful way is actually very difficult. And one of the main reasons why some researchers want to work with us and to publish their data with us is because they have a very difficult time in actually understanding what they've got um, with their own data management practices. And so this is one of the uh, sort of values that um, goes into uh, the data sharing. Now, if you were to try to reference this coin, and people do want to reference specific objects like this in this sort of research because you want to see comparanda to be able to relate finds that you have in your own project with related finds that might be uh, elsewhere, um, it's very difficult if a coin is represented as one of a number of, say, tens of thousands of other records scattered in 20 different files in a database that has an obscure schema that you've never seen before. And so this level of complexity that people are dealing with in archaeology is one of the reasons why we've moved to a publishing framework that's like this, that puts stuff up at the web, but has, um, is much more involved in terms of schema mapping and organization of the information than we see in other sorts of repositories. So obviously, that doesn't scale, and we need to uh, make uh, if, if the discipline is going to um, be able to tackle some of the questions of reusing data effectively um, uh, more widely, we also uh, need to address some of the key issues in data creation. And so here is where the data that we are curating um, feeds back into the data creation processes. Um, as people publish data with us, they're publishing essentially control vocabularies, typologies, ways of organizing the information that is potentially very useful for their colleagues to be able to use in order to, and that helps make the data sets that people create more compatible. So one of the projects that we're working with is something called FAMES, Federated Archaeological Information Management System. It's a project that's out of um, Macquarie University in, the, in, in Australia. And the idea there is to have this feedback to be able to um, make data creation more effective and uh, better organized and be able to relate it with uh, previously created data so that, so that the bigger picture can be easier to assemble. Now, again, back to the issue of um, common uh, schemas, formats, and ways of, uh, uh, of common interfaces on this data. Um, that, 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 that's helped in a number, number of respects. So one project that we're seeing now, this is our open science, um, uh, uh, Ben Marwick and Lincoln Mullen especially have been working uh, to develop an RStats package that is built off of our API. And it's built off of uh, not just accessing the metadata that's associated with the data that we're publishing, but it actually works with the uh, the uh, underlying actual data sets themselves, the individual records of these data, and that should enable a whole wide range of new sorts of visualization and analytic opportunities. And that, 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 that's now ongoing work. This is uh, some other work that's also coming. Uh, this is uh, Sean Graham showing a, uh, just a tweet of some work that he's doing on uh, topic modeling of the field notes and diaries that we've been publishing. And he's been doing a comparative study looking at several different projects that have field notes, seeing how archaeologists are organizing 
uh, their field observations and seeing if that can work with syntopic modeling. Again, this is something that is much easier for him to do because we've got a common API for him to uh, be able to get uh, down to these and uh, um, get to the data very quickly and, uh, and um, uh, commonly organized data very quickly. Now, back to the uh, high granularity issue. Uh, we're all, this is the web of data. Everybody likes to show this slide when they talk about linked open data. And um, what that's all about is using uh, stable web URIs as a way of uh, referencing con concepts and other sorts of entities. And this is where the data publishing um, aspect and review aspect become a, a lot more important. Uh, we have a bootstrapping problem in relating archaeological information together. We have very few archaeologists. We have the entirety of human prehistory to work with, and people are working globally around the world. So um, a lot of the time is with an arche individual archaeological data sets, like having a, a telephone but nobody to talk to, right? It's not very useful unless you can network with a wider group of people, and that's what linked data is helping us uh, do. So one of the one of the projects is providing linked data resources so, again, people can inform their own data uh, creation processes to make it better. Um, this is a uh, um, project called DINA, Digital Index of North American Archaeology, uh, where we have something like 400,000 archaeological sites that we're uh, publishing, uh, each minted with a stable URI. And then we can start relating those with other data sets and other repositories. So here's where those data are cross-referenced with the TDAR repository, Digital Antiquities repository, and um, with uh, other more specialized data sets. This allows some of these cross-references to be built. Now, um, how do we do all that? Um, the main thing that we work with is um, we're uh, a very hands-on editorial process when we're publishing data. So uh, the publication workflow um, uh, starts with a few people and then gradually involves more and more people. So when we, fir we first pub any data set that we publish with Open Context first goes through an editorial process where we are the ones that are helping the researchers do the data modeling to take the source data sets to be able to relate it together into a common scheme and into a common ontology that can be then uh, that we can then serve onto the web. A lot of that work is actually done by the editors. It also involves a lot of copy editing. There are a lot of errors in data sets. There are a lot of inconsistencies in vocabularies. These things we're typically fixing with tools like um, Google Refine, Open Refine. And um, then we're also uh, in that process working with the researchers to try to identify shared control vocabularies, linked data vocabularies that help provide a lot more annotation and documentation around their data that facilitate reuse. Um, once the data are published, we put it into the institutional repository, the California Digital Library, and then we publish uh, um, in response to people actually interacting with it. Um, and this is often uh, people on the same arch excavation team are saying, well, actually, the zooarchaeologists had an outdated uh, record of the stratigraphy. Everything is now wrong. We have to go fix things, and that, that's something that also happens. And this is where version control uh, with uh, GitHub um, becomes a lot more important. So this idea of um, continual fixing, continual revision is also part of the overall publishing and editing workflow. So just to uh, close out here, this does work. It does give archaeologically meaningful uh, insights. Uh, one of these studies was funded by the Encyclopedia of Life and the National Endowment for the Humanities. These are zooarchaeologists working in Turkey, looking at the origins of agriculture and, and, and interested in seeing how um, agricultural economies, especially animal herding economies, um, uh, developed and expanded uh, from, the, um, from Asia and then to Europe. Involved a lot of data for this field, so 300,000 records isn't a lot for a lot of other disciplines, but for archaeology, that's something like a four-person year investment total. So it's a huge amount of effort that went into this, um, 34 different kinds of contributors, and some of these data are quite complicated. So some projects had about 110 different descriptive fields. Incidentally, um, 
this editing process was also important socially. So some of the people that would contribute would be happy to contribute, but they didn't have the time themselves to fix their own data. One person had their data encoded in a 90-page PDF codebook, which took forever to decode. Okay, And so this takes a lot of time and effort that a lot of people just don't have. And so uh, this is one of the ways that, um, that, you know, obviously there's just a fundamental cost issue to deal with, but it's one of the issues that was really important to getting the uh, research outcomes. So just linked data, linking up all these different kinds of various terminologies to common um, control vocabularies. This is the Encyclopedia of Life concept for the for, uh, boss Taurus or cattle. This is a map of boss Taurus as it is now in open context. Again, uh, item level, being able to find specific instances of these things and records in multiple different data sets, that is something that's useful for the researchers. I'm going to skip that bit uh, just to show you lots of different vocabularies and ontologies that we're using in order to describe the bones. And the researchers who are uh, using this information are able to say something interesting uh, archaeologically. And archaeologists love to draw maps with arrows on them which is the great research outcome that's published in PLOS. Um, and um, so the data are there, um, accessible via that PLOS article. And there are, uh, so archaeologists had uh, something like a 30-person co-authored paper, which, of course, very few people who are, are going to get any credit around that. So that's, again, one of the big um, uh, issues with, with this whole thing. And it's remarkable. Uh, that they actually did this collaboration, and this is something I really want to uh, give kudos to Ben Arbuckle, who uh, cultivated this collaboration over several years. So I will um, end there with uh, uh, the Spanish Inquisition in the sense that um, the we ran into a lot of data modeling problems when we were doing this study. The zooarchaeologists uh, who were um, reviewing and looking at each other's data, they were giving each other one of the best forms of peer review possible. So in terms of operationalizing peer review of data, with the successful outcome around this is that we found was that it was very helpful to have researchers who are actually wanting to take a look at each other's data, wanting to reuse each other's data, because they were very motivated to interrogate each other's data in a very deep kind of a way. So they weren't just doing peer review as a service, but they were doing it as a method of trying to uh, address some of their own research questions. And so um, that's, that's something that worked very well, um, even though they did run into uh, some problems and interpretive issues in doing that. And we can talk about that later in the Q&A. So uh, thank you all very much, and I'll quit there with a nutshell. Okay, thank you. And our final presentation in the session, where we have a panel discussion. Is you? Yeah. Yeah, I am okay. okay. Great. Thank you. I'll try to be short as well as much as I can. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Oh, it's going on its own. I don't understand why. Hold on a second. It's not. can control it. Okay, so um, I am Susanna Asuntasanzone. I actually work for um, University of Oxford, uh, where I'm an associate director uh, at the research center. But actually, what I'm presenting here is uh, the activity around data peer review and the experience uh, that we have had with data peer review with scientific data, where actually I am an honorary academic editor. Right, okay, and that's it. That's it. Brilliant. Try to make it right. Okay. So, for those of you who are not aware, Scientific Data is an open access um, online only journal by an Asia Publishing Group. So, um, Scientific Data has introduced a specific content type called Data Descriptor. And Data Descriptor is that orange bit in the middle between a record in a repository and a traditional article because it's something quite different. 
So a data descriptor is really focused on the, describing the data that underpins a traditional article. A traditional article, you, uh, the author describe a, a hypothesis, uh, um, a specific a discovery they made, the, uh, but the data descriptor really focuses on the data that underpins those hypotheses, underpin those disco discoveries. But actually, it's richer than a simple data deposition in a repository, but also because the data descriptor serves as a link between many data files, perhaps which are in a variety of repositories, connect to the same uh, uh, traditional article. To say that, I keep saying the link between data descriptor and traditional article, which is true for many of the content that we have, but it's also true that we have a variety of data descriptors which are not linked to traditional publication. So this is like sort of unpublished data. Um, so uh, really very briefly about the content so that I can then explain our experience in the peer review and the data peer review process. So the scope of the data descriptor is really uh, to ensure uh, and to facilitate uh, the publication, the discovery, and the reuse of uh, the data. So the content of this article type, it's really focused on those sections which are um, usually um, very small, very short uh, in a traditional article, which is actually all the methods, uh, all the, where the, 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 the data is, what the data is, each of the data files, what the content is. Uh, what technical validation has been done, how actually the data can be reused in a diff different or relating context, and actually how the data is cited. And, and here, I think earlier, um, um, colleagues mentioned the 411 Code Data and RDA um, guidelines to cite the data, which we also follow. So data descriptor does not cover any of the hypothesis and the discovery, which is rather important as well, where we talk about reviewing the data in the data descriptor. So it is about discoverability because it makes this connection, as I said, but also because uh, the data descriptor has two components, has a narrative component and has also a um, machine-readable component, which is not just the, the, the traditional XML of the article, but it's actually something more. It's something uh, structured using control vocabulary from the community, and it's actually hosted in the nature.com platform, so they can be queried and, and retrieved. Um, this, this level of machine-readable information is actually achieved because in-house we have a data curator. So we don't just have the traditional staff that the journal will have, but we have somebody who comes from the, the data repository, in this case, actual life sciences, because scientific data covers life sciences and natural sciences that we're responding to social sciences. So in this case, the first curator comes from the life sciences, and she comes from from the, uh, the gene ontology, the bio-curation community. So she really has hands-on experience of structuring the information and making the connection between the article, the traditional article, the repository, and announcing the data descriptor. So going to the point of, of this section, which is the data feed review, it's how do we, um, we how our reviewer review the data descriptor. We put together a, a set, of, set of guidelines which actually echoed a lot what, what Bill already mentioned before. We have a, a larger, a richer description on, on the scientific data website. But really, very, very to summarize, these are the key points. Because data descriptors are about how the data has been created, not the, the hypothesis, we are not looking at an impact. We are not looking at the importance of size of the data. We are looking at is the data completely, is described that somebody can understand what was done and can potentially repurpose or reuse. Is it consistently structured according to community standard? Now, in the life sciences, I know that lots of people mentioned the word standards, but what we refer to here are content standards, minimum information checklists and terminology that a lot of communities specialize in certain areas have developed. In the life sciences, there are over 600 of those. Now, it's always difficult to try to use them all, but certainly the curator trying to use the terminology that is the norm in a certain community or in a certain data file. Um, it's, it's actually, are the data file um, um, uh, correct and, uh, and not corrupted and are in the right repository? And I will 
point to, I will extend this comment in the next slide. And particularly, is, is this uh, the experiment done in a very rigorous manner and with the right of quality control? Because that is all that the content of the descriptor is. That's why our reviewer can actually focus on this. They don't have to think about is the hypothesis correct, are the conclusion correct, because they do not belong to the data descriptor. So what we have learned by, by actually being live for one year, and actually today it's our birthday because we learned last year, the 27th of May, I just realized it now. So um, what we have learned is that, uh, you know, despite if you are having a, holding a data journal or a traditional journal, it's very clear that uh, making access to the data file, wherever they are for the reviewer easy, will enable them to really start opening the file. Because actually, um, I think, uh, Remember for one of the tweets that only like 17% of the reviewer of traditional journal really look at the data. And I'm, I'm quite surprised because it seems I, very few people do indeed look at the data because traditional journal has so much information, traditional paper, that after going to the data and, 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 and having to verify the validity, it's something very few reviewers do. So they take it for granted that they tend to focus on the conclusion and the hypothesis and the rationale for elaborating. Uh, those. So um, having a data descriptor, which focuses just on the data, really actually that's probably the reason why 30% of our reviewer, our reviewer do look at the data file, do look at the raw data file actually in these cases, that should be, I should be clear. Um, so we do provide a, the link to, um, to the reviewer for the, the data which need to be submitted prior to the review process. And, and the data uh, is, goes in specific databases, which we have selected recommended. And those databases, one of the key criteria for this database, they need to be able to allow confidential access to the peer reviewer, which is not necessarily the case. Um, that's the reason why we also developed, along with our data, uh, the peer review policy, our um, list of databases and criteria for selecting certain databases. Now, as I said, operating in the broader life science and natural sciences, where there are thousands of databases, the question is which one should a journal recommend? And, and those are the criteria we, we are using. And currently, we have a list of 60 endorsed databases. And of course, Dryad is one of them and it's our generalistic repository along with a couple of others. Um, and actually, it's the second most used databases right, currently in, uh, in TNDP data. Um, so a lot of confidential reviewer of the submitted data set is an important one. And you can get also, we have a specific checklist because now we have been approached by databases who want to be recommended by us. And the question is, we really are going through a, a total review and he now curator goes through the checklist with the, the database maintainer to make sure that they meet the criteria we want. And we are rejecting databases that don't fit our criteria. So um, what else we have learned from the peer review process? I believe that actually, you know, journal, scientific data and other that are out there doing peer review on the data, to add a constructive add the value service because not all repositories really uh, review the data. They do curation, they do certain validation on the structure, but they don't look at the content or, or the technical um, uh, soundness of the experiments. So there are a lot, there's a lot of data in the repository which is not necessarily sound and valid. And, and that's why journalized scientific data do add the value, in my opinion. And, and, and our, our process, actually, in our experience, has always been constructive. We have had, of course, rejection. Uh, we have rejected, but not necessarily because the data was actually uh, really uh, bad, but we do have cases where perhaps it wasn't statistically you know, enough uh, of, of value to really be uh, reusable, therefore we actually send it back, but in, in most cases, the, the peer review has been quite constructive. The last slide which I have, it's, it's, it's very clear that um, handling data and, and, and handling data peer review, you need to have a specific profile in in-house in the journal that really it's, it's somebody that understands what actually manipulating data really means. 
because um, working with the reviewer, you you know, you need to like manage them as after as Bill was mentioning, because the, the data is quite complex. There are many data types, and and also because the data get start get distributed in different repositories, you have to interact in many different reposit repositories. There are many different practices, so you need somebody who actually is familiar with the repository, familiar with the structure, the metadata that the repository has, and of course has subject matter skills as well. And and a data curator editor, it, it is important. It's something that each data journal should definitely have. Um, and I believe, actually, I have one last slide which actually simply summarizes what I'm saying because it simply plays scientific data in the middle between the research uh, papers and, and the data records and simply shows how it's intended to link and complement what the research article already holds and what the data record already do, but really putting on the focus on reviewing the data and get, give credit for um, um, researchers to share the data because simply depositing on the, in a database get accession number is not considered uh, of enough value. It's not something they can put on their CV, but uh, a data paper, and in this case, scientific data is also index and permanent. It is a publication, so they get the benefit of enriching and depositing the data and and progress career wise. Thank you. So uh, we have time for a little discussion, some questions. Um, we uh, have a mic with a bad battery, so I'll repeat the questions up at the front for the remote participants. Uh, Theo? Um, Susanna, let me just repeat and then you can respond. Um, so the question is uh, for um, scientific data, 30% of reviewers actually look at the data, that seems surprising. Yeah, and so what, what kind of data is not Into one of the mics? Or? Uh, one of them, okay. Right. Uh, so um, I should have asked her to clarify. The fact is that the data descriptor and the narrative and Don't get filled up with 
data sets where authors are just appealing to journals but aren't actually putting useful data or so for the benefit of those listening online, uh, the question, if I can paraphrase, was what uh, what can be done for traditional journals like the ones that CES publishes um, to ensure that authors aren't just um, uh, claiming to follow the policy by by um, without actually putting up the data files that uh, they really say they are putting up. And anyone to respond to this? I think most. Journals um, that use Dryad allow reviewers to look at the data as well as the paper. Uh, at least in any which case, I think an extra step that the journals or publishers can take is laying out some really concrete guidelines with respect to what the expectations are when reviewing the data uh, and in check Do you want to use the mic so, so I don't have to repeat what you said? Um, yeah, I just want to follow up with two points on that. Um, one, one of them is I think it was a pretty big step to get a lot of societies and, and uh, journals to start adopting requirements to make data available after publication of a paper, and I think that it's going to be a much bigger step to get uh, journals to and authors to agree to make their data available for a lot of journals anyways before publication. So I'm not certain that having pre-publication review of, of data is going to be a suitable solution to this problem for a lot of journals. We have had a little bit of internal discussion, and I'm not speaking for the BES. This was an idea of a couple of people who sort of like it, but the BES probably won't go with this is having more of a public shaming system for people that get caught cheating. You know, having a way to tag papers online as data is not available despite claiming it is available or data is not usable and using some sort of public shaming to get people to cooperate. But I was just curious what other sorts of ideas besides pre-publication review of data might be floating around out there. So, um, so the, the plus policy is that if it if all else fails, the paper will be retracted if they cannot make it. It's not so much about naming and shaming the paper, say this is a condition of publication. The statement is that the plus policy is that the uh, pop, um, will be for retraction of uh, papers for which that's found. I, I guess uh, one thought I'd like to add to that is so. Uh, the two workflows that I mentioned for Dryad, there's you know, after acceptance deposit or before acceptance deposit. I would really love to know to what extent there's a sort of sunlight effect of simply requiring them to deposit the data before review, even if the journal doesn't have any specific guidelines for review. As an author, knowing that potentially the reviewers could look at it, there could be a, a, a um, 
uh, React can be more conscientious just for that fact, as opposed to getting the signal that if you deposit after acceptance, well, clearly no one's going to look at it. So, you know, BS wants to do a randomized control trial where they're mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think um, that maybe the resistance towards having the uh, sort of at submission or full review, um, submission could go down because it, it, um, it used to be hard to have databases that could have anonymous review data. And now that that's available, it's really low at our threshold, or at least thinking about that kind of thing. But at least, you know, thinking about that kind of thing. Um, so I'm just interested because we keep talking about sort of the traditional paper and the data paper, and, and I'm just wondering, you know, should we just be moving away from the traditional paper altogether, really, to, have, to something where um, more likely you specifically have the data and then you and then you have sort of a more like, traditional view going on alongside? On so the question is whether we should be moving away from the idea of a traditional paper to a system where the data is reviewed independently and the, the narrative is then reviewed after that. Um, are you responding to this? Well, I have a question. Great question. I think the value on the market for any database is whether the format presented is in some sort of equivalent to the some international standard that can be replicated in any format presented or um, through a methodology systematically presented. So the question is. To what extent this data is compatible with the way data is presented in other databases, so that we, you know, the future merge or um, in any case, that's you know, the international equivalent of data, the way it's presented, and then to check in the question. I think that's where it becomes great and value for this data. If, if you have an extensive comment, I, I, you should come up here. <laughs> so just to paraphrase, I, I think the comment uh, was that the um, uh, adherence to international standard could be complementary to review of it uh, data for, for expressing value. The, the first is just a quick comment to respond to that. Um, we can we can uh, discuss whether we should move away from a traditional paper versus a data paper, but it doesn't matter what we think. It matters what our deans and department chairs think, at least in the United States. And until they shift away, um, you know, which gets at the first to um, actually all of the presentations we had in this afternoon session, which is what are the incentives for researchers to actually go through with data archiving, and um, you know the you know. No, no, I'm, I, I, no, 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 I, I realize that. Um, and if you're a department chair or dean, I hope I've offended you. And because really, that, that's really what I think it comes down to. So having a publication that you can tag on it. But I will tell you that in meetings with my department chairs, they'll still look at a data paper and go, well, you know, here's an actual, you know, this is a really rigorous analysis and, and this is a data paper. You know, they, that, that's great. But, um, and then, of course, in other disciplines, we've got the issue of whether, um, you know, it's a multi-author paper, a single-author paper, and whether those things become complicated. So I think the cultural changes um, that are um, that, that are mainly involving people who aren't in this room, for the most part, I think, are what's really going to move that forward. Um, uh, I'll let you respond. I actually had a, a question to draw in both the morning participants and the afternoon, but I'd love to hear the response. I think that, um, all metrics are going to help. They made my department chair's head explode. I put them in my annual evaluation this year, had no idea what to make of it. Zero. He was open to maybe getting an impact story profile for everybody in the department, just shelling out for everybody to have one just to see what it looked like. But just at this point, had no idea what to make of it. Well, we're in that early adoption phase right now, yeah. and that's to be expected in my mind. Um, I know a lot of universities are moving that direction a lot. Departments are, and there will be some bits and starts that you do that way. But if you're if you're a department chair or whatever, if you're weighing, you know, a peer-reviewed paper that is 
in existence for you know, X amount of time and it's got maybe one citation versus a data paper, a data product that's been downloaded 5,000 times and then cited 200 times, then at some point it becomes pretty clear where the bigger impact was. And I think that's where all metrics can help you know, balance that out and provide useful information for weighing the value of different types of data products or different types of scientific products. I think uh, for our experience, we've had mixed, mixed results for people uh, putting this on for their uh, tenure package. Mm. And um, so, uh, so sometimes yes, sometimes no. Things like all, all politics are local and all that sort of thing. What would really help also is if um, uh, professional societies offer guidance for, for reviewers, especially from outside the specific reviewers, because oftentimes with something like that, that's that where the start. For those sorts of advancements, you're also going to be reviewed both disciplinary. Mm -hmm. right? So um, to have something to weigh in somebody's space saying that my field expects me to behave in this sort of way with respect to data. Is going to be very important. So I think that, that, that that's one issue that's going to help. But um, final issue is, yeah, none of this works without addressing a lot of the institutional issues. Uh, it is sort of silly that there is only one way to advance your career, that every single institution has exactly the same sort of ranking for professors. Um, uh, there's in the digital humanities where a lot of work, there's this class of researchers called alt -Act. Alternative academics, and um, they're carrying stuff money people, not necessarily a desire for that, but, but it's reflecting the, the, the reality that we do need to have a little bit more diversity in the way that professional careers can, can, can go. And we should have data specialists. You know, I think that would be really useful to not just track everybody into exactly the same career path where um, we're going to get a lot of sorts of research. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think actually that this is about the table should be the Now that we should be the table, it is the data. They will be very well complement each other. Perhaps traditional research articles should go to a distribution process. And we should go beyond the PDF, PhD, version, and cover more, you know, consumer the live data something that are doing. So that certainly would be. Valuable, but that's the constant that they can infer, you know, the discovery part of the view on your view of the field. This is not what we have. So, a piece of could actually can. Mm -hmm. So, that's what they can. So oh, I was just going to follow up with you. you know, it's easy, it's quick. So this is for um, both the morning group and this afternoon group. I'm editor in chief of a journal. For whom 50 percent of the submissions come from developing countries. These are researchers working on tropical ecosystems, and that brings with it a whole set of cultural issues about data sharing um, and willingness to make data available to other researchers. These are data that are long term in terms of their collection. They're um, very valuable. Um, these are their historical issues of um, parachute science people coming in, doing research, leaving. Thanks to Henry Wickham, I had a hard time working in the Amazon. So my question is, um, what have people found in terms of data submission, the morning session, about issues um, from people from the Global South and whether researchers have expressed any particular concerns about making data available and then in terms of the review of data, for those of you in the afternoon session, whether there are any particular issues um, reviewing data um, that are coming from countries where either English isn't the first language or even the, a common language of science um, and um, people from developing countries. Um, I'd like to acknowledge you very much for the policy to squeeze all the top data issues to the squeeze. Um, and it's amazing that, for example, we did away with uh, data, uh, the option of an embargo at the beginning of the year, and all they have to do to get one now is email us with a portion of the embargo system to policies by just simply making them right on the end um, so on the same issue, I haven't really had people complaining about um, my data 
that is my dear that I'll share it. It's mostly I think there's issues of sort of a bit peripheral, but then they just do it anyway because they recognize the requirement for publication. I think that's because there's a longer history of archiving data at Gen Bank and like that because Gen Bank and there is a lot of things. Uh, it's actually it's, that history that should be a, a stumbling block for us because now people now think that they've got gem bank numbers that they've completed the data up there. But in fact, they've got 10 more data sets there. But I also have a question. So I've become aware recently there's a group of ecologists and evolutionary biologists putting together an angry paper about data archiving. Um, and I just get to the know these are the groups that have 20, 30 year data sets, um, and they don't want to share because and and I so I, I sympathise and uh, from what I can tell, maybe Bill was exactly, but I don't think there have been many uh, people starting up with long term studies in the recent years as a fear that they're just going to give all the data away and each they can't build up the long term. Series and then start publishing from it. Um, so, I mean, that would be a tragedy for ecology if we end up not doing long term studies at all. They're really, really important. I think we need to think as a community, people interested in data archiving, and how we accommodate these, uh, these groups that are doing excellent, important research but are being very much hamstrung by data archiving requirements or feel very much that they're being hamstrung. Well, my idea would be. Uh, uh, instead of having data completely open, this would bring better and have you know, members only access to all the data sets. Um. Well, I, I need to respond to that. <laughs> I work with Long Term Positive Research Network for a couple of decades. And when NSF started mandating the data be made available as long term studies, you know, we saw the same thing. All the researchers said, People are going to scoop me, they're going to misinterpret my data. You know, I've invested tons and tons in this project. Uh, you know, and this dealt with new as well as older data sets. So, I mean, we, we heard all of those concerns uh, you know, over a period of several years. And finally, the, the network office. Executive Council for LTR and NSF just got together and said, we're just going to do it. And they made all of those data available. None of the fears materialized at all. In fact, those people that were most vociferous about their expressing their concerns oftentimes ended up as beneficiaries in terms of being asked to be part of synthesis efforts, to uh, collaborate on other publications and so on. So, I'm not actually aware of a single problem that emerged from that. And now there's some 6,000 data sets that you can log on to LTR, uh, download, look at, you know, uh, whatever. And there's well over 20,000 publications that have been generated as well. So I say that. And on the other hand, I've also been working with the Organization for Tropical Studies. And they have a policy where people can come in, do their research, and they can take their data back home, and they don't have to publish it. They don't have to share the data. And what's happening there is that a lot of 20, 30, 40 year old data sets that are incredibly valuable are going into the grave with the, the researchers when they die. And no one is able to access those data now. We're recognizing NSF and others are recognizing, including many PIs that also have their own research, this is a serious problem. You know, we screwed up. We need to fix it so that we don't have people taking their data to their graves. So. Any last thoughts on the last third Maybe to increase the visibility of the data based on contract is to really track this idea to a national and the community um, across the and community community 